Okay, well, I'll get started because nobody wants to be late getting out tonight, and people may, may wander in. Uh, I'm Alan Goldberg. I'm uh, with Novak, work at MITRE Corporation. Uh, been involved in space systems engineering off and on for, uh, depends on how you count it, since 1978. Um, before that, I, I actually tried to train as, as an astronomer, but realized I really wasn't a good astronomer. I had more fun being an engineer. And luckily I had an opportunity to do that, so that's what I've been doing ever since. Uh, I became interested in this topic, well first of all, uh, this is about telescopes and art and a little bit about history, and I don't claim to be an expert in any of those. But at one point, uh, actually about a year ago, uh, first of all I had known about Russell Porter from Stella Fane, I've been there a couple of times. Of course, he's, he's very well known for having started, started Stella Fane and the Springfield Amateur Telescope Makers. Uh, and I had known he was associated, I knew he was associated with uh, Caltech and Palomar. But about a year ago, I was at Caltech and was, was literally wandering in the corridors just seeing what interesting stuff faculty posted on their, on their doors. And... Um, saw some of these drawings that Russell Porter had done, uh, which I'd been vaguely aware of. I knew he'd done sketches. But in particular, <coughs> in particular, up on the wall is, is this sketch of the mirror support. And being a geek, I stood there for probably about 15 minutes looking at it, trying to figure out what was in there. Well, we'll talk about more about that later on. Yeah. And actually, uh, also part of the introduction, this is sort of a work in progress. Um, I'm only speaking tonight because nobody else wanted to last night, uh, and I'm sort of the fill-in. So I was preparing this as sort of a talk for the club at one of its meetings sometime down the road. And actually, it grew up into two talks, one about Porter, one about the design of mirror mounts. Because th and they both came together, they both started with this. So this is his detailed drawing to help people build the mounting structures for the 200 inch. And seeing that and thinking I, had, I could figure it out because in, in, in some of the stuff on Hubble there was some analogous kinds of problems. Um, that got me interested in looking into exactly what the background was uh, of Porter and how he got from uh, a competent telescope maker in Springfield, Vermont, to designing something like this for probably the most challenging engineering feat in astronomy. And I'm comparing that to Hubble, he did, he did this kind of work without computers and anything like that. What they did for the 200 inch was quite amazing. There's also a very good book which I, which I recommend to everybody and uh, interested in, in telescopes and amateurs and astronomy. And that's called The Perfect Machine. I forget who the author is, which is the history of the building of, of Palomar. And um, the story of the technical challenges, the industrial challenges, the bureaucratic challenges seem to be fairly well done. And it's a fascinating read. So it, it sort of came together with this picture. And what I did is I started looking into his history. He was born in uh, 1871 in Springfield, Vermont. And he went to some typical school for an upper middle class kid. Uh, he went to a military college for one year. He went to University of Vermont for one year uh, in mechanical engineering. And then to my surprise, I found out that he went to MIT in architecture. So now, wow, now I'm really interested in it, my alma mater. So I figured it would be easy to find out information about him. I go into the super secret MIT Alumni Association and I start Googling uh, Russell Porter, nothing. No mention of him. But a book which was written about his biography says quite clearly that he went to MIT. And if you look him up in the Caltech archives, on their online archives, it says he's MIT class of 1896 in architecture. Um, MIT has digitized all its yearbooks, actually the students who run the yearbook. So I go to the 1896 yearbook and there he is. He's a member of the class of 1896 as an architecture major. Uh, 
And I start looking, it also mentions he was a member of the yearbook staff, he was in the photo club, he was in the architecture club, he was in the surveying club, it was big. Uh, that, that's a senior portrait, that's what he looked like back then. Uh, and I looked through the yearbook and found this, now it's got, it got washed out on here, but uh, this is one of the drawings he did in the yearbook and this one happens to be initialed someplace down here. It was an introduction to a section of the yearbook. It's not a great discovery of art, but I'm probably the first person who ever bothered looking through the yearbook to see if there was any art in the yearbook done by Russell Porter. So this is one of the first things he ever did, and it has nothing to do with anything directly, except it showed he had some interest in art and some skill in art, independent of... No, it's not bad. No, and, and it was just one of those part-time things. And there, were, there were probably other drawings which he didn't initial, but this one has um, RWP. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't show. Um, and at that point, I, I picked up a book which is a little bit harder to find of, of his biography, which was written by, I think, Don Woodbury, who was a member of the Springfield ATMs and had gone through a lot of the archives. Um, and it did have more detail. And what it pointed out was that while he was at MIT, he heard a lecture by Perry, the Arctic Explorer, and he became fascinated by the topic of Arctic exploration. And apparently in his last semester, he just up and left and joined an expedition to go to the Arctic. And it was part of and sort of indicative of the eclectic career he was going to have. So he joined several expeditions um, from 1894. And I don't know why that date is before 1896, but it said 1894 to 1903. He made six trips to the, to the Arctic as expedition artist, surveyor, and general reporter. That's uh, his work? Yes. Wow. Uh, a lot of his, for a reason I don't fully understand, a lot of his artwork is in the National Archives, uh, NARA. I'm sorry, not the National Archives, at NARA, National Archives and Records Administration. So it's not online. There is an article online about his work. But he did a lot of watercolors. Um, in one of his trips on the SS America, they were frozen in to the ice and they had to overwinter on their own resources off of Greenland. Um, on the upper, th this is his map of several of the places he went. He did quite a few trips in here. Some of the trips never got to the Arctic, uh, as was the typical of the case around 1900. He did one trip going up to Nova Zemlya, uh, Murmansk and Nova Zemlya. Um, and you can see all this zigzag stuff. I think that's where they got caught in the ice and they just went with the ice. Later, in later expeditions, he was one of the organizers. He was one of the people who had been there before, so they'd get some big name to lead it, and he'd be the guy who made the, the thing work. Uh, he also joined his brother, after he had experience up there, he joined an expedition to Mount McKinley, which he also considered the Arctic. He didn't climb Mount McKinley, but he was the base camp crew. And I think he thought he'd get together with his brother and do some gold mining while he was there. Um, what's that? Hmm? Gold mining. Um, this... Uh, this image, I think, was entitled, What Happens to the Watercolors at 60 Below Zero? <laughs> when you try to paint. It apparently made our trials and trepidations minor in comparison. Um, and he did, by the way, lose a lot of his hearing due to apparently frostbite of the ear, which, which um, caused him problems later on. Uh, and they had to... Uh, find their own food. This is an example of uh, a bear hunt and this was a somewhat of a self-portrait. He shows himself here doing the drawing of the people in the bear hunt. So he was getting pretty good with no formal training. Um, 
It did also, in some of the reporting, make him sensitive to comfort and observing. When he became later interested in astronomy, he, ha he had his fill of being cold and miserable. <laughs> and one of his goals in design was comfort for the observer, which we'll see later on. That's a nice sentiment. Um, during World War I, he had apparently picked up some interest in optics already. He had been interested in surveying. And he seems to have worked for National Bureau of Standards during World War I, although I didn't see much detail about what he did. And after that, he actually went back to MIT and he taught architecture, even though he had never graduated. I guess they were a lot more informal about those things. And of course, architecture is more a craft than a science. So he had a, he had a mentor who had been his undergraduate advisor who hired him back in as an instructor. And I was able to validate that with the yearbook too because they had a list of faculty in the yearbook in those days. And he seems to have been there something like two or three years. But then he decided he had to do something more specific. So he went to become a, basically a land developer in Maine. And he bought a tract of land in a place called Fort Clyde, Maine, Port Clyde, Maine, about 1906. And he started to build himself houses of his own design to be an astronomer's uh, artist colony on the water in a very nice part of Maine. It's, it's still a nice part of Maine uh, on the south coast. And he did his own illustrations. And unfortunately, this is really washed out on this projector. I don't know why. Hmm? Uh, the, colors, the colors are much more vivid. But he designed individual, he didn't do tract housing. He designed, a, uh, uh, he, he designed a series of individual cottages. He bought an existing house for his own purposes as a base, basically the, farm, the farmstead. And, um, and then uh, started building other housing to sell. And he apparently did pretty well on it. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe brightness down and contrast up. So the general trend is he was just, I'll say, bumming around learning things, applying what he had learned. Uh, in outdoor stuff, because he was an outdoorsman from his youth in Springfield, Vermont, which was pretty rough and tumble in those days. Yeah. And you can see he had, uh, he had the idea that uh, the gentleman landowner would have his telescope there to look at the bay and to look at the sky. Mm -hmm. That little refractor was the telescope you were talking about? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's no, there's no specific reference to that. He just included it in his watercolor concept drawing for what things would look like. These are some other drawings of his. This is a, a detail for the fireplace. This is a stained glass window he designed to include in one of the houses in memory of his w overwintering on the America. I don't know if you remember, but back a couple of slides, I had a sketch. Well, he did it and he, I don't know if he himself did it, but he had a stained glass. And I bet he did it himself because uh, he built furniture and everything else for these houses. He built this community building uh, for the area. And this is one of the houses. And if you pay attention to the style, this will come back later on. No, this is this Land's End development on the coast of Maine. Okay. This is all, I, he, d he built, I think it was about 12 houses there. And while he was there, he modified <coughs> his farmhouse because he'd become more interested in, in telescope making because he had seen this book, Glass Working by Heat and Abrasion, 18, 1899, London. Uh, and he became fascinated with the idea that 
you could make mirrors. And Guy knows this picture well, but this was his introduction to mirror making, not so much telescope making. Uh, the book is entirely on, has been scanned online. So look up glass working by heat and, f and, and uh, abrasion. Uh, a lot of it is about glass blowing. When they talk about glass making by heat, they're talking about glass blowing. So it's sort of scientific glass making. Um, and he made, not clear whether he made these mirrors, but one of the, the addition he made to his house was to put a, uh, basically a siderostat above an extension that reflected the, s the sunlight, uh, the starlight, up to a primary mirror, which was on the, this is not a chimney, this is a pier, and he put a long focal length mirror up here, and it came back down under the, siderost the siderostat to an observing location inside this little library addition. Now, Guy knows this too. You put a, s I think it was a 16 inch, I have a note someplace. I, he put, you put a mirror up there with a long focal length. You operate it as a Herschelian, that is no right angle, no, no pick off. Um, and you try to ma manually guide a siderostat. It, it ain't going to work. It's, it's not a good design. So a lot of what he did, and uh, I think this follows through in his early work, was clever but not necessarily good. <laughs> but he was learning as he went along. He also had apparently his own little uh, meridian view. I don't know if he had a telescope behind there. This is a picture, a 1915 photo of his house, which was in an article in Sky and Telescope, when they found buried in the sand one of the Siderosat holder mirrors with a half gear on the back. That's the only thing they've ever found of this. They have the picture, they have this, this piece that they found, rusted mess, no optics. So he was already thinking about the comfort of the observer, clever designs and ways to do it, uh, and making his own telescopes because you couldn't buy this stuff off the shelf. So with his increased uh, capability in optics, and having basically made some money and married at that time and completed what he wanted to do in this development, he was hired by his old buddy, James Hartness in Springfield, who was now the owner, president of James and Jones and Lamson Machine Company. And Hartness was very interested in screw thread standardization. <laughs> Not a big thing now, it was a big thing then. Now you go to Home Depot, you say, I want either fine or coarse thread, and the bins are all mixed up so you don't get it, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but it's standardized. But it's standardized. It's yeah, right. Um, I can tell you stories about my Russian friend and metric screws. But, uh, <laughs> so he and Hartness, he, uh, Hartness hired him. He said, hey, I could use an optical guy to help with this screw standardization. And they invented the optical comparator. This is the patent. Oh, do I see the date? 1923. And and this is, yeah. This is this is basically a projection microscope. So you'd put you'd put your your workpiece in here in the patent or here, and it projected a beam of light and cast a shadow onto an optical system, there's a little telescope in here, and it projects it very large so the machinist can see the quality of his work. And he can see it without looking through a microscope, he can see it in a shop environment. And I guess Jones and Lamson, w this is a modern one, they probably were making this for 70, 80 years. And one of the problems is they never break, so they just keep on getting reused and resold. So he was, he was doing some optical design for his buddy Hartness. Um, and he decided that 
he could start teaching mirror making to his buddies at Jones and Lamson because they were mechanically oriented and he had, I think like a lot of people, he had access to the boss's hardware and tools and stuff. And so this is his first notice of a telescope making class at Jones and Lamson. Uh, and I probably have the date for that someplace. And you can see this is his cartoon of what you're going to do with it, although he was Truth in advertising, he was not making refractors. He was making reflectors. But I think he couldn't get the point across with a cartoon of a reflector. And this is him, not, not quite then, but this is him at the pitch lap doing what Guy does, pushing glass at Jones and Lamson. He also, hmm? what's that? Does he have a, yes, he attached it. Well, I, I think all the standard books say you use some pitch and you put a handle on the back. I, I remember that, and then, and you give it a whack, and it comes off, and or maybe not, or maybe you break the handle, or the glass. Or the glass. So, um, and this was his view. I showed Guy this earlier during his talk. This was to try to explain to the people in the. Uh, by the time he formed the ATMs, um, he wanted to summarize for other people what it was involved in making in making mirrors, and he was trying to automate it. This is also one of, uh, obviously one of his sketches. He's getting pretty good at sketching. The other thing of relevance that he did while he was at Jones and Lampson, he came up with the idea that you could make a small telescope for the gentleman or the gentle lady to put in their garden, which they could observe the sky at their leisure from their garden, and that you could make it out of rust-proof materials, and it would be weatherproof, you just leave it there, uh, and make it decorative. He used a Newtonian design. Here's your primary mirror. This is one of their sales brochures. Um, uh, a paraboloidal or maybe spherical, I don't know, primary mirror, six inches. Uh, a pickoff uh, prism in this case. He did, yeah. Probably to protect the reflective coating a little bit. And an eyepiece holder. All cast out of bronze. Uh, bra Bronze, for, for, uh, oh, Catherine fell asleep. I was going to, what would he have made it out of? Bra a bronze? Bronze, yeah. Bronze, yeah. Um, so the mirror out, so you keep it inside? No, you, uh, there was a cover for it, and when you put it in the rest position with the cover, it was a sundial. So it, th there was a gnomon, part of, part of this or this whole thing served as a gnomon, for the garden sundial when you weren't observing. And, um, and this is what... Uh, uh, no, this would not be... It, it, you'd, you'd have it pointing... Uh, you'd have it pointing north. You'd have the gnomon uh, pointing at the pole, I think, for the sundial. Um, and this is him assembling them. And apparently they sold a few hundred of them. They made some money at it wasn't a big seller. It was before the Depression. It was when m money was available because it wouldn't have lasted through the Depression. Uh, but the thing to notice is a little feature of this that the uh, equatorial feature here is an open horseshoe. And the telescope rotates in it. And the mass of the primary mirror balances the mass of the Second of the uh, eyepiece in the secondary, and you may notice this later on. He also patented, now I'm not sure if this was included in the patent for the garden telescope, but he did patent the idea of this horseshoe. Is, is that existing piece there? Is it, is someone, still on someone still has some. There is also a company that's making reproductions. Is the search on garden telescopes? Yeah. GardenTelescopes.com. And Tell them the price. Have you got the price yet? Uh, you're all sitting, right? At the Hartness House, yeah. Yeah. So what, what they've done for the modern reproductions is they've digitally scanned one of the original ones. He got permission from the descendants and the story and some of the narrative about it is they're, they're having a heck of a time finding a foundry 
who can cast this to maintain the precision that it needs. Just putting in the final shape to, the, to making the mold does not give you the final shape after you cast it. So they've, they had apparently a lot of trouble tweaking the mold such that after it solidifies, it's the right thing. And it's probably because, you know, this kind of, uh, of skill is a relatively lost art. It was more common in the 20s. I, don't see any I, I think it was 8,500. <laughs> but there's a, pi there's a picture on the website of the, of the owner showing it to the queen at a garden show in London. Um, No, that's their sales brochure. Th this? So that's stuff to the left of the vertical part. Oh, that's just the trellis. That's just okay. your garden. Your garden. You, had to have the gar you had to have the trellis. Uh, okay, let's move on. So, um, uh, what am I doing here? Why didn't the second picture come up? There it is. All right. So, Hartness also was an amateur astronomer and Hartness at his house in the town of Springfield had built a turret reflector telescope. I'm pretty sure that Porter did not get involved in this or he was not the instigator of this. But if you've ever been there, there's an underground passageway from what's now Hartness house to this, oops, to this structure. So you don't have to go outside at all to get to the observatory. And the observer sits in the center of rotation. Here's the polar axis. Here's the rotation around the polar axis gear. And the declination axis is around this way. So you could be inside and see a, 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 um, a right angle bend, sort of a coup d'oeil refractor. And this is something that Hartness built. So now, Yes, the lens, the, the objective lens is here. And it's counterbalanced in both dimensions. Uh, the, well, the, the, lens, the lens would go up and, here's, here's, the de here's the declination axis, here's the polar axis. So this goes from the horizon up to the pole and it rotates around. Uh, those trees were not there, I assume, when they built it. Uh, this is a modern photograph of it. But inside the eyepiece never moved. The rest of it rotates around the eyepiece. Well, the, no, the eyepiece, the eyepiece goes around. You can still get a headache and fall over. But um, you're inside, you're in the center of rotation. Your head's in the center of rotation. And you're, the main thing is it's heated. Now again, when we talk about uh, clever versus good, uh, heated inside of a telescope with the outside exposed to Vermont <laughs> is not the best way to get good at, well, it does mask the quality, you don't have to buy the best objective, let's put it that way, because your seeing is always bad. <laughs> you know, and the, and the clearer the skies are in the winter, the worse you're seeing, because you've still got that little room toasty. Um, now, when I, I jumped ahead a couple, but um, that gave Porter the idea that he could build a reflector to do the same thing. And this was, in his mind's eye, what such a structure would look like. And when he actually built it on, on Breezy Hill, this is what it looked like. But it had the same purpose. Now, this one's a little bit different, and you can't see the detail, but um, the optical design is the same as this. He's got a right angle flat with the central hole and that flat can rotate around the declination axis to change the declination of what you're looking at. It reflects a beam of light into the primary which forms an image through that secondary hole, that hole in the, in the flat and your eyepiece is inside the dome. Now, when I first looked at it, I said, okay, well, it's just a fancy version of, of this. But it's not. This 
Um, no, uh, let, me, let me not say. Uh, it, it is to, for practical purposes. Th there could be a difference if you've ever seen some of the domes they're building now in South America for the ultra-large telescopes. The opening is a circle on a 45 degree rotary. Uh, it's a weird, but, but it means you don't need a full slit. It's an aperture which can move from the horizon to the zenith and you've got two degrees of freedom. You can control it in azimuth and, elev and elevation. And I'm not sure if he might have been thinking about that, but because it also could be latitude 45. So I don't know, because he was near, Springfield is, is about 43. So it could be something from what he was used to. So this is what they built. He and his buddies from JNL, who had founded Springfield Amateur Telescope Makers, they built his idea in a much more rest uh, restrained manner. He also had other ideas for telescopes, and I should have done this bigger. He had other sketches for ideas where the observer stayed fixed and the telescope moved around him. Uh, and in some of these, this is called a Springfield reflector. I don't, I've never seen one. Absolutely. But uh, you would stand at the top of the pier and the telescope would sort of rotate around you in various ways. Well, when you think about the flexure between the axis and the primary mirror, you're just cantilevering the whole mass off of a bearing where your head is. That's a bad place to put the weight. And there's no place to really balance it. You're stressing the polar axis in that design. So, so um, they decided to get a little bit more organized and they formed the Springfield Amateur Telescope Makers. They had the first Stellafane, which they called at that time Stellarfane at Breezy Hill. They built their uh, building, which is still there, still pink. The heavens declare the glory of God. Um, this is Porter. This is Ingalls from Sci Scientific American and the editor. And he's going to become important because he had heard, he was a New Englander too, he had heard about Porter doing these intriguing things in Springfield. And he started asking Porter to write up some of his stuff for Scientific American. And that became the origin of the Amateur Scientist column. First, I think it was the Amateur Telescope Maker column. And that became the Amateur Scientist in Scientific American. But um, that gave him national exposure. And a guy by the name of Hale um, found out about this guy and said, hey, he might help when we get some money to build a telescope in California. Uh, he might be able to help us with some of the design concepts. So this is a little bit out of order, but um, they brought him to California and he went there in mm, 1928. He was hired by Caltech because the Rockefeller Foundation gave the money for the 200 inch telescope to Caltech not to the Mount Wilson guys for several political reasons um, that are brought out in that book, The, the Perfect Machine. Um, and Hale thought he'd be a good guy to have on the staff because he knew about telescopes, he knew about design, uh, he was a smart guy, and there weren't that many telescope makers in America in those days. Most of the good telescopes were still being made, or the complex optics were being made in Europe. Uh, of course, Alvin Clark and, and the several of those lens makers were here, but they weren't necessarily designers of large instruments. Uh, sort of as an aside, while he was in Pasadena, they, uh, the city of Los Angeles decided to build Griffith Observatory, and um, he was brought in because he was already in Pasadena, and it wasn't until 1994 that they discovered that he designed the place. Oops. He, he, he did the original, yeah, he did the original sketch design. The only picture I could find directly that he did was his sketch for the focal pendulum display. But he was sort of an outreach guy having done his ATM thing and he had ideas on, on the observatory and the planetarium and, and what would be done. And um, in several of the references it pointed out he wasn't the kind of guy who went to a lot of meetings and wrote memos and things. He'd be asked a question, he'd produce a sketch of what the answer was and give it to you. 
So it wasn't until they found his sketches of Griffith Observatory that they real realized what he had done. Uh, oh yes, he used, yeah, the, the aliens always land there too. So he was at Caltech and the first job they gave him was design the Robertson Astrophysics Laboratory. Um, Caltech in 1928 was sort of just evolving from being not much more than the junior college. Millikan, I believe, was president. He had decided to make it into a big place. Uh, getting, getting the Palomar contract was a big part of it, but they had no real astronomy department. So he built the Robertson, um, the Robertson Astrophysics Lab, which is now uh, environmental sciences. It's not, uh, astronomy has a be better place. Uh, and um, in the renovation, they retained, there were, two, there were two domes on the top. One was a solar telescope and one was an optical telescope. The optical telescope was for student use. And the solar telescope was for real physics because Hale was basically a solar astronomer and he was very interested in maintaining expertise. So the solar observatory consisted of a uh, sideris, uh, heliostat on the roof in the dome that pumped a beam of light down the center of the building such that it could be picked off on all the floors with pick-off mirrors to do your solar spectroscopy or whatever it is you wanted to do with real live sunlight. And now it's used for environmental lighting. It's basically a large clerestory or whatever that thing is that picks up sunlight and distributes it in an environment Oh, sorry. In an environmentally friendly way to some of the lower levels. And they do have on, I forget, I, I guess this level, this is probably one, two, three. So on the second floor, there is a, uh, a lounge area with the solar disk projected all the time. So you can just look up and see it on the, on the ground glass. Okay, then he started working on the real thing. Um, the first thing we did, he did was design a set of 10 telescopes which could be used for site uh, qualification to send out all over the Southwest. They knew they were gonna build it someplace in the Southwest, but they didn't know where, and they didn't have microclimatology data. So he made 10 identical telescopes which were all set up to look at Polaris because he could train people to all look at Polaris, to find it, look at it, record how much jiggling. I don't know how they recorded jiggling. It probably was a reticle in there that measured the amount of seeing. And people could take notes. Fun job for graduate students. Here, go out there, spend 30 days looking through at Polaris and record how much it's jiggling. Um, and in your free time, you can do whatever you, you want in the middle of the stinking desert. Um, so he designed those, and he, and, and he had it with uh, a small adjustment for uh, inclination, for, for elevation here, and with built-in sharp, spiky things so you could tromp it down in the ground, and once you get it set up, it would stay pretty well. He was trying to think about user comfort. He also, Fritz Wicke came back from Europe and said, I just saw this new thing called a Schmidt telescope. Maybe we should do one. So uh, Porter designed first this eight inch Schmidt. And when I say design, he, I, I would say he probably had nothing to do with the optics because the optics was done by others, was both built by and specified by others. But he designed the mount. What would we do for this? As a proof of concept, he did an eight inch and they liked what they saw, so they told him to build a 18 in 18 slash 24 inch Schmidt. They approved the financing. So an 18 inch corrector, 24 inch uh, spherical primary. And this is the building he designed to house the, the Zwicky 18 24 inch Schmidt, which was the first one ever used in North America, in, in the Western Hemisphere, for scientific research and it was the first telescope on Palomar Mountain. Um, this is the upgrade, this is the 1824, as it appeared in the shops at uh, Caltech, where it was built. 
So he, he, wasn't, he wasn't using the um, horseshoe ring, but one of the gripes against the 100-inch telescope by the, uh, the Hubble crowd, the extragalactic people, was that the 100-inch and the 60-inch could not see the north circumferential area. It had a English mount, is that right, where there's a, a, a bearing both at the north end and the south end, and you can't look north, you can't look at the pole. Uh, it's sort of a double fork, if you imagine. You have a fork up and a fork down. And the extragalactic people felt that there was a lot of interesting objects near the North Pole. Of course, they had never seen the South Pole. But, um, <laughs> if they had only known, right? Um, and they one of the things they wanted for the new 200-inch was a clear view of the North Pole. So he's, he's now influenced by that gang. And when he builds a telescope, it's got to see the North Pole. He also designed the, uh, the monastery at Palomar. Uh, I asked you to look at one of the houses he had built at that uh, development on, uh, on in Maine. It's very similar architecture. It's sort of, I, I don't know, I'd, I would say without knowing the details, almost shaker, you know, very simple design and nicely balanced. That's at Palomar. That's the monastery at Palomar. And that's still a, that's a modern picture. The, um, the 1824 Schmidt is gone. I think the building is still there. But it's decommissioned. The mount is actually in the visitor center. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's in the visitor center. I think the telescope itself was rebuilt, but the mount is original. If yeah. I, I, there was some illusion that maybe it had become a student scope or something like that for experiments. It's, it's probably a very good telescope. Mm -hmm. um, his next job was, part of his next job, was helping to sell the telescope idea. Because it wasn't a guaranteed thing, especially as the development was getting more and more expensive. Kodak was supposed to make the original mirror, uh, not Kodak, I'm sorry, Corning. Corning. No, GE was supposed to make the original mirror. They were going to make it out of, they were going to convert their process for making microscopic quantities of fused quartz into a 200 inch blank. And they failed miserably <laughs> in, in Lynn, Massachusetts. They were trying to scale up the gas, fu gas fusion, fusion in the sense of melting process to come up with a huge blank. And it was only almost dumb luck that Corning proposed doing it out of Pyrex which, by the way, was not Pyrex, it was something else, but it was branded Pyrex because they wanted to sell baking pans, um, which was the problem. They had this capacity. They thought they'd make it out of the same stuff as the baking pans. It turned out it wouldn't work. They had to invent a new material, which also was a borosilicate glass. But, um, yeah, the cost was going up, had to continually sell it. So here's, here is a model of the 200-inch he made which I think is also in the visitor center now. And then he started doing these sketches of what the telescope would look like. Now it's hard to see from the back, but in addition to showing the telescope in the zenith position, it's ghosted to show that it can point due north. It's ghosted to show that it can point to the equator. It's also in that position that the observer can climb in to the prime focus cage. So he's showing how this elevator ladder system, elevator like a boarding ramp, would allow you to get to the telescope in certain positions and then get a, a joyride as you run around the sky sitting in the top. It shows how there's an alignment between the bottom of the telescope and some open ports down here that allow it to go to the illuminizing chamber because once it's in that building, it's not leaving, but it's got to be illuminized periodically. So you have to get it down to a vacuum chamber, and as Guy knows, they, they were already illuminizing, it wasn't silvered. So it's showing the mechanical layout, and also the, um, the um, coup de focus uh, spectroscope chamber, which would be temperature controlled, so you could have your shell spectrograph, and the lights bouncing all around. We're gonna see more pictures like this, but this was typical of what he did. Now the most amazing thing, aside from the fact 
he was able to envision how to do this ghosting and cutaway was the fact he was drawing this from blueprints. He did not have anything to base it on. People were sending him prints. He had done a sketch. And he was iterating with them. The things which are done now in computer-aided design where you see that things actually fit and the wires go where the wires go and the pipes can get from A to B. He was doing all that in pencil and charcoal to prove that everything that you needed for a telescope would fit into this thing. Uh, one of the design issues which he was involved in was the North Bearing. Uh, the, this is an early sketch of, of what they were going to do. And this shows roller bearings for the North Fork, the North uh, Horseshoe. And then they went to the nice guys at Timken and the Timken guys said, no, you're not going to do roller bearings. Even if we can make roller bearings, they're going to indent the horseshoe and you're never going to move it. So in the later drawing, and I just reversed this so it's in the same orientation, which is why the text is backwards. He had gone to the oil bearings. Someone proposed mobile, mobile oil, said we can do oil flotation on large pads of relatively low pressure oil continually flowing and that bearing will, will float on them. You won't indent the horseshoe. It'll move very smoothly. Of course, they always were proud of the fact that when it was in balance, it only took like half a horsepower to move it. Of course, that's once you get it going. <laughs> it wasn't that easy to get it going. But there again, he was able to do concept drawings, which now we think of routinely from computers. But he had to do it from his mind's eye. And this is what it looks like now. Um, he also designed the building. This is his original watercolor for what it should look like. He liked that shade. Uh, he, got the, he got the greenness of the vegetation on Mount Palomar correct. Uh, and it was going to be illuminized. It was going to be aluminum paint. And originally it was aluminum paint, and then they found out that was the wrong stuff. So now it's white, and the whole building is white. I guess they get sick and tired of the color, but he designed it. He liked simple lines. He didn't want to, he'd gotten over that business with all the columns on his original design for the turret telescope. He also, in World War II, got hired away to do art for the DOD. He apparently did training manuals. Oops. He did training manuals for landing craft operation. And he did training manuals on how to make roof prisms, poro prisms, for binoculars because the optical companies engaged amateur telescope makers to make prism, inver uh, prism erecting systems out of poro prisms. And he wrote the guide on how to do it and how to test them. He designed the building, this was not a great architectural feat, but this is the building in which the mirror was ground. Uh, at Caltech, and apparently it was the biggest lab ever built at the time. It was like twice the width of the mirror and many times longer, because obviously one of the things they had to do was the testing in there. So it had to be at least the radius, probably longer. Uh, it, I'm not sure if this building is still there. I got, I got mixed. I looked for it when I was there, but I'm not sure. It certainly was renamed. Uh, it may still be there. It's a basement of an instrument shop because they want it to be temperature controlled. So no windows. And you get an idea. He also designed basically a scaled up version of that Rube Goldberg thing he showed in the cartoon because he was the guy who knew how to make mirrors of the gang. And apparently Making the machine out of steel was an innovation. Before that, grinding machines had been wood because nobody had made anything. And apparently, even the 100-inch was ground on a, on a wooden machine. Now, that was about 20 years earlier. So the technology moved. Is, is where? As I, 
At Dulles. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I'm trying to think back. I, I remember something in the back of the place. Yeah. I don't remember the, anything that big. Well, okay. And um, this was just a, this was a corning um, shot of the mirror. Uh, I'm sorry, not a corning shot. A, a Caltech shot of the mirror, where for not only having the individuals for scale, they've got Herschel's telescope in here, um, Newton's telescope in here for scale. How big it had gotten. Now I'm going to transition a little bit over into the mounting stuff, and I'm not going to talk a lot about the mountings because it's getting late. Um, this is the rear support for the mirror, the support cell. And it's, it's got all these little doodads that were shown in the sketch. Uh, I forget the number, it's 20s or something. Uh, and this is him later in life, again at the eight inch. The, um, these supports caused about a year's delay in the in the availability of the telescope because the first time they made them they had too much stiction they had all the right kinds of parts but the small changes in position didn't cause the moving parts to move stiction is a name for st sticky friction when you when you have uh, when you're trying to get something to begin to move but it hasn't quite released especially if you don't do it very often it doesn't quite weld but it gets, it, it sort of indents itself and mates. It takes more force to get things going. They had a problem with stiction. The, all these things were supposed to be free floating. Uh, he did get to see the telescope, the 200 inch, actually before, before he died, but uh, before the original official dedication. Um, they sort of thought he was difficult to get along with but in, in his biography, they said that was because of his problem with hearing. And um, he didn't quite get it, and he didn't socialize a lot. So I'm going to jump to, if I know how, I'm going to jump to this to quickly go over the drawings. And I'll only do some of these. So this is his overview that you saw before that showed in grossly the paths. But then he started going into the details, and he drew these so the people would know how to build it, would have a concept. Um, the area of the south end of the polar of the south end of the telescope, the tubes, the, the structural tubes that held the south bearing to the yoke were large enough to walk in. as is shown here, the guy climbing up the inside. And he, you know, it's kind of thing he pointed out, well, you could put stairs in there if you want people, otherwise they're climbing up. And they have to be circular stairs because you don't know what orientation the guy's going to have to climb in there. This is a detail of the south bearing. Uh, it had to be hollow because the light could be going down the south polar axis into the spectroscope room, which was at a coup de focus. A coup de focus doesn't move as the telescope turns. This is the uh, right ascension drive, which was all electromechanical in the sense of analog com of, of um, AC motors. Um, complex, complex gear drives in here to get both guide, position, and slew rates for the telescope. You know, now on your little telescope you have a rate one through nine button. Well, all that was done with clutches and motors. Detail of the flotation uh, support to the yoke, which also had the details of the stiffening members inside the yoke. One of his things was, like most architects, hide the dirty details, make it look smooth on the outside, but have a lot of detail in there. Of course, this was, uh, and not of course, Westinghouse actually built it. They built it in Philadelphia and then sent it in parts to California for assembly because Westinghouse had just built Hoover Dam and uh, the, the, the working parts. And uh, they had the largest machine shops in the country. 
This is the workshop in the area around the declination axis. Again, this is, um, this is one of those uh, rigid tubes. Here's the declination axis with electrical pass-throughs, and here's a guy in a little shop working on the gears or whatever, trying to put things in scale so people would know what they were doing. This is the Naismith focus, which I see no record of ever being used. So this is opposite the side. This is a declination axis opposite where those electrical feed-throughs went. You could have a fold-flat mirror pop out inside the optical path, and it would divert the light through the opening in the declination axis. I don't know why you'd want to do that because that, that port rotates around and is very difficult to mount instrumentation at. And I think it may have just been that what it was good at, you didn't use that. This is the cover for the primary mirror. He had, he had pedals um, to cover it. R really a bummer to drop a wrench when the thing's uncovered. And I don't mean to imply that, that Porter did all this. There was a very strong team of engineers uh, including uh, Sororier, uh, the Sororier truss mount that people talk about. This was also the first Sororier truss. It's not just a truss. It's a truss that's designed to keep everything lined up under flexible deformation. When they first tried to make the tube rigid, such that it maintained precise alignment under all positions, it was like two and a half times too heavy. Sororier came up with the concept to let it sag, but have the sag for both the mirror and the, sec and the secondary, the primary and the secondary, the same amount stay parallel. And by careful balancing of materials and shapes, they were able to do that. So when it's horizontal, both the primary and the secondary sag, but in a controlled manner. So it's really a flexible tube in the details. This is the pickoff mirror um, that controls between the coude operation and prime focus. So this is, I don't remember the, uh, the dimensions, but this is a fold flat. And as Guy mentions, flats are not easier than curves. And they had a lot of big flats in this mirror, in this telescope. That's a that's a big piece of glass, and you can get an idea of the scale just by the, by the uh, from the back surface because he's ghosting it. You can see the support structure because they lightened these mirrors when they when they made the casting. They didn't make cast them solid. This is uh, the area around the primary focus. The, I'm sorry, around the yeah the prime focus. So the prime focus cage is up here. There's, a correct, there's some correcting optics if you're doing prime focus photography. Here's the Cassegrain mirror, which would flop down from the bottom end of the, of the prime focus cage. Now, in the hooker, in the 100 inch, you had to lift off the prime focus to put on a Cassegrain if you were oper swift, uh, shifting it. They didn't want to waste the time. Time was too important. So they did it with fold mirrors. Now this is a, um, this is not a fold flat. This is a Cassegrain secondary. So this has to flop into position precisely. The flats are a little bit easier. Uh, and you can see there's, there's windlasses, gear, there's uh, chains and stuff to, to make this happen. This is just a view of the, of the observer in the primary. Uh, this is getting to the Cassegrain focus on a tower. They said originally there was an idea that there'd be something that looked like a child's swing that was hooked up to the bottom and the observer would sit on it and get hoisted up to the Cassegrain focus. What happened to Comfort? Hmm? What happened to Comfort? Well, that was, that was, that was, the man that was management's idea. And, and this, is th this was... Um, yeah. This was, this was what Porter and the astronomers came up with. Give me something nice and rigid. <laughs> uh, now, this is the, uh, the mirror support, and this is just a blow-up of the same thing. Uh, 
The second talk, which I'm not giving, is how this thing works. But what's happening is, instead of saying the mirror is rigid, and I just need to support it in three points, and that, and that controls where it is um, for alignment. It's saying the mirror is flexible, and because of that, I have to support every piece of it with exactly its weight. But not only do I have to support each of it with its weight when it's pointing straight up, which is fairly easy, but as it moves over, I have to su start supporting it this way. And the further over it goes, the more side force I have to apply and the less back force. So what's going on here, and I do have the drawing, but I'm not gonna go into it, is these kinds of weights are on a pivot that pushes up against the mirror element. There's a whole bunch of these. And when the mirror is pointing this way, the full weight of these guys is pushing up. When you rotate this around 90 degrees, the full weight of this is pulling down on it. It's not pushing up at all. So the, the teeter-totter is going from this way to this way, and a teeter-totter this way doesn't work against gravity. So it becomes a zero force. Conversely, these weights are also pivoted around a point up here such that when it's horizontal, the weight of this is pushing that way. Now the reason I said I had seen some of this in Hubble, the problem in making Hubble mirrors was that they had to emulate zero G as they were machining it. They didn't want the figure to be perfect in 1G, then go to 0G and spring into some other shape. So they had to support the mirror in the figuring, not, not in grinding, but in figuring as if it were 0G. And to do that, you have to support every element by its weight. Make every element float. There's a little problem of how you make it stop moving up and down, but they, they handle that. So in addition to being a balance mechanism. It's a balance mechanism in three dimensions and in two of the dimensions it goes from zero to positive. In one dimension it goes from positive to zero. So it's a very complicated machine and I saw no reference to any documentation. There must have been documentation. And they had to make 56 of these or whatever the number was and they all had to work because if any of them stuck it would be a low point. They also had a problem that when the thing went sideways, the, uh, the weight of the surface face would be hanging down. And I read the description, but I don't understand it. It was supposed to generate small S-curves uh, of a controlled magnitude due to the shear force. But the basic problem is when you're doing a very large mirror, you have to treat it as if it is rubbery. It's microscopically rubbery, but it is rubbery. And that's where you can't assume, because you can't afford to make it so heavy that it really doesn't move. You know, guy, guy knows this, all these rules of thumb. What if you really want a mirror to be uh, self-supporting, it's what, one to seven maybe? Or even thicker, one to six. So a 16 inch mirror would be like three inches thick and a 200 inch mirror would be 33 inches thick. And uh, Corning wasn't signing up to that. Oh, I did put the diagram on. Okay, so this is what it's, yeah, okay. This is what it's doing in the side load. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the other one. Anyway, I start to work on that. And this is the drawing of how it gets to the illuminizing chamber to show that it fits. And then he also did similar stuff for the 48 inch Schmidt which was being built at the same time because they realized the field of view of the 200 inch was so small it wouldn't discover anything. Uh, Hubble had sort of this problem too. So at the same time they built a 48 inch to look for things to examine in detail with the 200. Um, and I don't know, is this the largest Schmidt ever built? Uh, you know, do it once and do it right. And <laughs> you know, they took a picture of everything, there was nothing left. Then they did it a second time to show proper motion. Once you take a picture of everything, you're done. Okay, that's it.
That's enough. I'm a little bit over. Um, when, I, when I get this refined, I may give it at the club, but I will also talk about flotation mounts and the details of that mechanism. But I appreciate your attention. I, uh, I had the opportunity to go to Palomar uh, earlier this year. If you go over there uh, during that weekend, you can sign up for a tour with your guide. If you definitely want to do that, don't just show up behind the glass and see the thing behind the window and nothing else. Make sure you get uh, the tour and they will take you down to the shop to show you parts, to show you the uh, luminizer, to show you everything. They will take you inside of the chamber of the telescope and you be able to walk around the, pl uh, the platform as well. Uh, the telescope, of course, still used for science, so uh, it's not available, you know, for you or anything like that. And if you're interested, I think we're still continuing at Mount Wilson, which of course is not nearly yeah. as much designed by Russell, but uh, we have a two-week session for serious amateur astronomers and uh, astronomy graduate students or undergraduate students who are interested in telescopes. Yeah, and, and and some of these telescopes, yeah. some of these tel yes. some of these telescopes are getting a new lease on life with some of the advanced techniques. Mm -hmm. They're basically working around the uh, sky pollution, and they can um, they're large enough, and they're especially they're beefy enough that you can put very complex compensation mechanisms on them. So they can improve the effective surface figure of the 200 inch. Um, and I, I, did have, I do have in, in, in one of my backup charts what the control mechanism looks like for one of the huge South American ones. But there, now we've got strain gauges. So you can measure what the force is on each one. This one had to be done passively because they couldn't measure it. They just had to tweak all those counterbalances and that's what took them an extra year and a half. Plus, they had to figure out the lube problem. Station in Southern California for 10 years at the Air Force. Always meant to get down there. And you have to do it as a tourist. Yeah. Only as a tourist, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, now, if you absolutely want to watch through it, all you need is $30,000 and a companion case for the science committee. And <laughs> they'll give you for $30,000 to give you one night in order to be portable for weather. <laughs> We don't have weather problems. No, the guy that was coming to Tursa has a Chinese group that had gotten a 